Okay, I'm looking forward to the talks. We have uh, Samantha, take it away. All right. Oh, one second. How do I do it not in, I'm just gonna do it like this. I don't know how to do it not in presenter mode. Okay. Um, so my data is part of an ongoing study that's measuring weight loss uh, in individuals who are classified as either o um, overweight or obese. Um, but since this is an ongoing study, it's not complete. And everyone in the study was in, assigned an intervention group. So um, I think some people got a nutritionist, um, some people were enrolled in exercise programs, but um, since it is ongoing, they ha the investigators haven't revealed who was in which group. Um, so for now, we're just going to look at uh, the cohort's weight trajectories over time. We do know that all participants had uh, free access to the wellness center on campus. In general, they were incentivized to lose weight. Um, so there, oh, participants were also asked to step on a Bluetooth scale uh, once a day over the course of the study. And there are three cohorts in the study. The first cohort was sampled all prior to COVID. Um, the second cohort overlaps a little bit with COVID. And then cohort three was sampled completely during COVID. So what we would expect is that in general, cohort three's weights would be a little higher um, just because things were shut down. Um, so based on the table, we kind of knew that the time span would be different by cohorts because since it is ongoing, we do not have full data for cohort three. And then um, the, the race distributions are also a little different by cohort. So my research questions of interest um, were to understand the trajectory of weight over time. So I use functional principal components analysis for this, and it works pretty similar, similarly to principal components analysis, but is um, more applicable to longitudinal trajectories. Um, ultimately, it's just trying to determine the pattern of variation and then fits a smooth curve and the um, package I used uses um, generalized additive models to do it. If any of you know Julia Robel, she's like the queen of our um, functional data analysis packages. She's on all of them. Um, so my other goal was to understand if there was a relationship, this is actually a little wrong, um, between time in the study and weight loss. Uh, I used a linear mixed model to do that. Um, I did not actually account for months of the study. Um, and then since the time points are equally spaced, I use an AR1 structure and a random intercept for participants. So the data that I got was already pretty clean. Um, there were some outliers already removed. Some uh, families had like children use the Bluetooth scale or their like spouse used the scale. And so they kind of had to determine um, which values to remove. I'm not sure how they determined like the range um, but they did that prior to me getting the data. Um, and then all cohorts started at the same time, but ended at different times. And so for consistency, I just uh, truncated the data to a year. But of course, this for cohort three, we still didn't have a full year of data. Um, so Emily mentioned in her presentation that it's not really recommended that you weigh yourself daily. And so we didn't necessarily have daily weights. So instead, um, I took a average of the week. And then after that, uh, there were four participants who were missing more than 50% of the data, and I removed them. And then once they were removed, the average um, percent of missing data was 8.1%. So these are the weight trajectories that I got from the fun functional principal components analysis. Um, what you'll see is that for cohort three, even though they stopped early, the package still kind of uses what they know from cohorts one and two to fill in the data for cohort three. I definitely did not use any of this data to run a model. And I used only the data that we did have. Um, but based on these trajectories, cohort three did start at a higher weight than um, cohorts one and two, but they all seem to lose weight over time. All right, so this model has gone through a ton of tweaking and it'll probably even change between now and when I submit my paper. 
Um, but from this model, cohort two does weigh uh, significantly less on average than cohort three. Um, females weigh significantly less on average than males. Um, an Asian participant weighs significantly less on average than a white participant. Um, and there is what we would expect, a significantly negative linear effect per week. And then the quadratic term for week is significantly positive, which is telling us that as the weeks progress, um, the participants are losing less weight, um, which we kind of saw from the trajectory curves that it, like they're losing more at the beginning and then it sort of flattens out near the end. And then um, this data definitely did cause some interesting problems for me. So it would, of course, be nice to use as much data as possible. Um, so rather than looking at the scope of a week, look at the scope of um, days. But there was a lot of missing data if I did that. I think one way to handle some of the missing data, if there were small strings, would be maybe to use last observation carry forward. But um, so since there were some larger strings, that didn't seem like a good solution. Um, and then the effect of age is an absolute mystery to me in this model. Um, the model I presented gives results that we'd expect, but I ran through some models where a continuous age resulted in a positive estimate for time, which doesn't make sense, but a categorical age using the same model um, resulted in a negative estimate for time, which is what we would expect. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm not really sure what's going on here. Um, but changing the scope to weeks seemed to help. And then again, as this is an ongoing study, we are without intervention information as well as complete data for cohort three. So in future analyses, we can use all of that information as well. Thank you. Nice job. Questions for Samantha? Can you go back to the linear mix model slide? Oh, yes. Uh, what was your, was your outcome just like continuous weight? Yeah, so I calculated the average weight per week. And so it was the week average. I think since our projects are similar, <laughs> the only thing I was like wondering yeah. is uh, if it would have made sense to calculate like percent weight change or like <laughs> include like a baseline weight as a covariate. Yeah. Because saying that like women weigh less does make sense. But if you're thinking about like weight change over time, they're probably gonna lose less weight than men. So I think that that like was a little bit confusing. So I wasn't sure if you had like a covariate for baseline or not. No, I didn't, but that's fair. So let's see how that graph up. Um, these are predicted values, right? Yeah. So um, everyone, you notice the, the little spikes in there. <laughs> Do you guys know what, that, what that's caused from? Or, or Samantha, this is for anybody. I believe it's, it's those are where, mis, where there's missing values. And what happens is the, the bloop estimates are not necessarily on the curve that would follow just the, 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 the predicted mean values. The bloops actually can move off of the, the, the lines and the curves. So, so that's just the nature of those, the best linearly unbiased predicted values. They don't necessarily have to fall on the, on the curve um, that, that are not only just predicted mean values, but, but you know, the X beta hat plus ZB hat, these predicted values where, the, where we did not observe a weight don't need to follow on, on the, uh, predicted values. So if you look at the formula, you can figure out it has to do with the correlation between the missing and observed values. So um, that's that. Any other questions for, for uh, Samantha? I've got a couple. Well, this may be beyond the scope of your research, so if it is, just say so. But I was curious if you had any idea um, from a population perspective, just what the impact of having like heavier overall weight gain or slower weight loss um, of COVID is? Oh, I, I'm not sure about that. Okay. <laughs> but very interesting. 
I had a question, Samantha. Why, why did you remove subjects that had less than 50%? Of oh, greater than 50%. Yeah, it, it, greater than, sorry, greater than 50%. Why did you remove those subjects? Um, I guess it's just that I have heard that you should do that for these things. I, I had been working with my thesis advisor and she said that um, that would be a, like a good rule of thumb since they have so much missing data, hmm. but, but maybe not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I would, I would think, um, you know, it's, not to say it's a wrong approach, but I, but it, it certainly won't eliminate the problem that occurs by having missing data, you know, and that's one of the things that I have to talk to my clients about is that they're like, oh, let's just include everyone that completed everything. And it's, it looks nice and tidy, right? But it doesn't, it doesn't eliminate the problem caused by missing data. And I think it would be similar in, in this respect if you say, we're only going to include people that had a certain amount completed, um, you know, and, you know, do the reasons we talked about before, but, but uh, just something to think about. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other, one other question I had was, um, and, and I should tell everybody, I've been working with Samantha a little bit with this data and, and I got really intrigued by it and, and I'm looking at it as well, but um, what about including the cohort by time interaction terms you know i know i know in your your functional pca mm -hmm. you showed those graphs right and those those i'm assuming don't they aren't constrained to be that have the same curves right no time and so they they did indicate that the pattern was kind of similar between cohorts but i'm, I'm thinking that in your linear mix model you might want to include the cohort by time interaction just to just to verify for sure that the the patterns over time aren't significant. Maybe you did that. I don't. I don't know. But if no, not, that that would be something to think about. Okay. Um, okay. Nice job, uh, Laurel. You're up. Awesome. Okay. Okay. So. I did my project on um, an analysis of hate crimes in Denver, Colorado. So a little bit about the data that I found. It was collected and published from 2010 to 2020, but at the time that I had accessed it, there was only one observation in 2020 that had been reported. Not that there was only one instance of a hate crime, but that it had only been recorded at this point. So it's an open source database that's not guaranteed to be complete. So my guess is they're gonna update it sometime next year. Um, the data was provided by the Denver Police Department, and it contains a lot of interesting things, um, such as like the date, the location within Denver of the hate crime, the type of crime, um, the type of bias that motivated the crime, and the case status. Time is particularly interesting here um, because it's broken into multiple categories. So we have year, quarter of the year, month of the year, day, and then we also had time of day, although I didn't choose to model that for this project. So it would be really interesting to look at how these multiple forms of time interact, specifically with serial correlation. So here is kind of a base table to get some, get an idea of the data. So on the top, we have um, the five different categories I use for the type of bias. So there's religion, race and ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender, which for this data set was specifically transgender, and then um, disability. And so overall, if we look at the years, um, 2014 has the lowest proportion of the overall count at only 4%, whereas 2019 has the highest proportion at 17.8%. We also see interesting trends in quarter where um, quarter one and four have only about 21%, whereas quarters two and three have closer to 30%. Um, so what is happening there? Um, for the description of the hate crime, the largest proportion are the two types of assault, um, aggravated or simple, um, and then criminal mischief is the next co most common one. And then most cases did not have legal action taken at the time of the data access. There was a lot that were pending or um, on pause, and so I think that might be contributing to it. And then um, based on, so then you can see at the bottom the type of bias in the overall count, 
race and ethnicity um, motivated crimes had the highest count um, of 258 and then disability had the lowest at five and so for the purposes of this project I needed to remove disability because um, I didn't have enough data points to to look at it. So some things I wanted to explore was what is the relationship between time and the rate of hate crimes in Denver and then what is the relationship between the bias type and the rate of hate crimes. So some hypothesis that I looked at to get to a final model is, is there a relationship, um, a quadratic or cubic relationship with year and count of hate crimes? Um, there is a relationship between type of bias and rate, and there's a significant interaction between type of bias and rate. So to do this, I used a Poisson framework because I wanted to look at the rates and my data is in count form. Um, and for any quarter or year that did not have a um, hate crime of a certain type happen in it, I included zeros here. And zeros in this data are meaningful because they indicate that something did not happen um, in comparison to that we're missing data for it. So this is a um, bar plot of the years broken into the type of bias. So we can see it starts um, a little bit high around 2010, drops until 2014, and then increases um, to its highest point in 2019. Um, and then you can visually see that race and ethnicity has the highest, followed by sexual orientation. Um, and then I included disability here on the bottom just so we can see which years it fell into. One other interesting thing here is in 2016 is when basically the anti-transgender crime started to be reported. Not that that's when they started to happen, but when they started to be reported in this data set. There's one in 2013 um, as well. So looking at month and quarter, there's also trends here. We can see they're kind of similar where they peak in the middle of the year and are lower at the other ends. So my question was, um, when I'm looking at the serial correlation within the years, should I use quarter or month? Um, and in general, the models that use quarter um, over month had um, higher significance and lower AICs. I think this might be due to there's less um, degrees of freedom used and enough information was captured by quarter that I didn't need to use month specifically. So the next step was deciding how to include year in my final model. Um, so I have linear, quadratic, cubic, and categorical. The top left is the quadratic, and we can see that both linear and quadratic are highly significant. But then when we look at um, the cubic, cubic is not significant, um, which I think is really interesting because this indicates there's not evidence of a flattening out at the two extremes. Um, there's evidence that it continues to go up rather than slowing down um, in 2019. And then overall, categorical time had the best AIC um, at 914 versus 923. Um, so this was the best model overall. And we can see that um, there's a significant decrease in the middle of the years, 2014, 2015, and then a significant increase again at the end. And then I wanted to look at um, the type of bias here. So these estimates I've shown are from the M means package in R. So it's estimating the actual rates for each type of these. Um, and race and ethnicity had by far the highest at 6.45, um, um, followed by sexual orientation with 3.67. Um, Anti-trans crimes were the lowest at 0.45, and all of these were significant. Um, I also looked at these rates um, after controlling for a year, and those same trends um, held all of which were significant. And um, when I was doing this portion of it, I discovered that my data was over dispersed. So both of these are um, from a quasi Poisson model. The top one has a dispersion parameter of 2.21, and the bottom one has a dispersion parameter of 2.1, um, two, wait, sorry, 1.788. Um, the next thing I looked at was if there are interactions with time. When I used categorical year, which is what I used for my final model, there were no interactions. However, when using linear or quadratic time, um, anti-trans bias-based crimes um, always had a significant interaction, which is pretty interesting because if we think back to that bar plot, um, they first took off in around, I think it was 2014 or 2015, and before that hadn't been as present in the data. So it makes sense that we have interactions here. Um, and then the other variables were not significant, which could be um, an indicator that in general, as the overall rates rose, the rate for each group rose in proportion as well. 
So bearing all of that in mind, I then created my final model. So what I had used was categorical time, um, which is the best version. I did not include interactions with time as these were not significant with categorical time. I included both bias type and year, and I knew that we had over dispersion. So now I wanted to account for serial correlation. So I used a GEE. I used SAS to fit this model. Um, and I included the model or the code below. I used the model SE um, statement to help account for the over dispersion. And so the top graph is my GEE and the bottom one is if I had not accounted for serial correlation. So we can see that the scale for the GEE is 1.33, which indicates we still have a little bit of over dispersion here. Um, and then the effect of accounting for the serial correlation is that we had um, slightly more conservative estimates for the standard error. So some things that were significant when not accounting for it became um, not significant when we did account for the serial correlation between quarters within a year. Um, and then looking at time, we know that the rate for in 2019 was approximately 44.9% higher in 2019 than it was in 2010. Um, so these are the results to the main hypothesis. I've kind of talked about this before, um, but for hypothesis one, we know that there is a significant relationship between the type of bias that motivated the crime and the rate of overall crimes, with racially based hate crimes being the highest, um, and then sexual orientation being the next highest. And this maintained even after adjusting for years, serial correlation, over dispersion, all other variables included. Um, we also have a significant quadratic and um, quadratic trend, but not cubic. And um, interestingly, the model that only included categorical time accounted for approximately 38.6% of the variability in the data. So a lot of the change has to do with time. Um, and for hypothesis three, we only had evidence of a significant interaction with anti-trans crimes and time. And in general, we have over dispersed data with serial correlation and therefore we should use GEE modeling. A major limitation of this is the data that I originally had um, had 20 different categories for type of bias. I collapsed these to five um, in mine in my study to help preserve sample size, although this bar chart is an example of if I'd only collapsed it to 11. So we can see that um, different types of bias do operate really differently over time. Um, the largest proportion is anti-black hate crimes, and then the next one would be um, anti-sexual orientation. Um, but I think it's pretty interesting to look at this until we really think about, as we're collapsing categories of statisticians, what information are we losing? Um, and how can we best preserve sample size and still be representative of the questions that we're asking? Um, data was open source. Um, and I haven't really looked at other variables yet. I'd be really interested to look at type of crime, location of crime, case status, um, et cetera. And then this is only about Denver. There's a lot of other cities that this is an issue for. And that's the end. Nice job. Thank you. Questions for Laurel? I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, why, maybe I missed this, but why do you think things are higher in like quarter two and three and in the summer? Is it just easier to commit hate crimes like when it's not cold or yeah. are these like happening outdoors or indoors? It's a great question. So in my exploration of the data initially, a lot of the violent hate crimes happened in places like sidewalks and public transportation. And so I think access to people um, during the summer months might have a big impact on it. Um, although I don't think it's just that because a lot of them happen in homes as well. And so I think that's why it still maintains in the colder winter months um, instead of like dropping really low. Uh, I was wondering what would happen if you considered using an offset for total population in Denver, just because I know the population has gone up quite a bit. Yeah, um, absolutely. If, I mean, although you still saw a drop in 2014, 15 relative to the beginning, so I'm not sure if that will matter or not. Yeah, um, I think that, that would be a really good thing to look at that I did not yet look at. Yeah, and also related to that, I'd be really curious. I don't know if there's any type of data on this. But just for instance, when you saw that, oh, the rate of transgender hate crimes was uh, lower than, say, race and ethnicity, mm -hmm. I'd be curious, like, if there was any data that had an estimation of what the transgender population is in Denver, because mm -hmm. I imagine 
it's probably proportionally very high. Yeah, so like offsets for type or um, for the number of people who are trans in the city and an offset maybe for the number of people who are people of color in the city. So we can get a better understanding there. Yeah, I would be really curious about that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, because there are really different populations in Denver. I think that's one of the tough things about um, this kind of data is having it be really representative of people and having it not look like anti-trans hate crimes are not an issue because they're a lower number. Um, it's likely because a they're not maybe reported as much because um, we noticed it only started reporting in 2014, 2015. Um, and also it's a smaller population. Other questions? Do you have um, a sense of- yeah, Go ahead, Kerry. Do you have a sense of that dip in 2014 is real or if it's like a reporting bias almost? Yeah, I am not sure. I think I tended to think it was real because the data was reported by the same entity over time. Um, but I'm not sure what happened at that point in time. Yeah, but it, but it, you know, you notice it, it declines to that point and then it, in, it increases from that point too. So it's, you know, you can look at the trend going down to 2014 and then how it changes and maybe think about, you know, bigger uh, changes going on in the country that could affect uh, that. We, you know, I, I think so. Laura's going to look at other cities too. And it'll be interesting to see if that a similar trend occurs in the other cities or whether it's different, you know, it'll be quite interesting. Um, so uh, you use GE, is, is there a reason why you chose that over uh, like pseudo likelihood, which, which would also allow you to do the serial correlation? Um, I'm not sure there is an exact reason, but I enjoy GEE and okay. I thought it would answer my question. I know I wanted to use AR1 because I was going to have equally distanced um, times with meaningful zeros. And so I went with that method. Okay. Okay. And one, one question, I probably should know this. What is a Nagel-Kirk R squared? Oh, that was just the R squared that was reported by R um, when I had done the procedure, the Poisson. So I think it's um, a analog to other R squared um, that are reported. Okay. Although that's just, does anyone else have other experience? <laughs> it's funny, you, you, there's so much stuff out there. It's like, you never get to the point where you stop learning. You see something that's like, what, what is that? <laughs> I've been around the block, but I but there's still stuff out there that that I see, and it's like, oh, that's 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 new to me. Um, okay, good job. Uh, we have uh, Matt, Colin, or Caitlin. Who wants to who wants to go next? I can go. Okay, Matt. All right, all these people are doing like really serious, impactful projects for the world, and I'm just looking at basketball, so I feel kind of dumb, but yeah, here we go. Uh, no, no, it's all good. <laughs> no, no, it, it's gotta be fun too. So yeah, I did my project on uh, NBA scoring, looking at, yeah, well, I guess you'll see in a second. Um, so yeah, I, I don't didn't know what data to use for a longitudinal project, because nothing I do at work kind of has this, but I thought, oh, I bet sports have a lot of longitudinal data. And indeed they do. Um, there's a lot of teams, they play a lot of games, they play every year. Um, so there's great uh, places to do longitudinal, longitudinal data modeling there. Um, the data is also really nice because it's clean. Uh, there's no missing values. There's no outliers. Um, and I also really like basketball myself. So that was a fun reason to do the project. Uh, just for laughs, here's a picture of me as a young high schooler. Uh, I wasn't very good at basketball because I didn't realize how big I was. Uh, even though I'm very scared of the opponent, and he's very small. So anyway, um, I, I could have modeled like, you know, what helps you win or lose a basketball game, but I figure that's been modeled enough. And with the recent advent of sports betting in Colorado, I thought, hey, it would be fun to model something that has to do with sports betting. 
I'm not going to advocate that you bet on sports, but it's a fun modeling procedure anyway. Um, and one common bet is like a total bet or an over under bet where you bet how many points will be scored in a game. And the, some dealer sets this number and you can bet over or under and whether or not you're right kind of determines how much money you make. And so that's the project I looked at. I wanted to see how well can I model how many points are scored in a game by a team. Um, I wanted to do this with like uh, time stats. So like season, the number of games in the season, the team and the opponent and home and away. And then also look at non-scoring statistics like rebounds, assists, steals, blocks, turnovers, and fouls. Um, the data I'm using comes from Kaggle.com. They have a bunch of fun data sets for stats and machine learning. Uh, there's four seasons worth, and there's just like all the data you would expect to find about NBA games. Uh, so the methods I went through, I did a lot of just looking at the data descriptively, seeing what type of patterns I could see with visualization, uh, and then of course doing increasingly complex longitudinal models, trying to parse out all these relationships and dependencies. Uh, so here's table one, kind of looking at all the main predictors of interest that I used. There's other predictors in the bottom row, like seasons, game numbers, teams, and home and away. But those aren't very interesting because they're uniform for every single team. Um, but here in this table one, we see that from year to year, things really don't change that much. Offensive rebounds stay about the same. Defensive rebounds stay about the same. Everything stays the same except for points. And there's a huge upward trend in points from 100 to 102.7 to 105 and 106. And this is just like a year to year basis. And that seems like a pretty big increase in points per year. So I was really interested in seeing how season played a role in how many points people are scoring, um, mostly over the other uh, auxiliary statistics here. The other thing that's important to notice is the total fouls and the opposition total fouls in the bottom. You'll see that those uh, data are the exact same for both rows. And that's because the way this data is collected is that there's two rows per game and one row represents one team for that game and the other row represents the other team for that game. And so a lot of stuff is counted twice and I'll get into that a little bit more, but it was an interesting thing to navigate with the study. So I made a really fun, colorful spaghetti plot to look at uh, the scoring over time. It's fun to follow the lines and see the spikes and the lows. These aren't per game. These are average scores. Uh, per game per month, so that there's not too many lines. Uh, but you can see there's a slight upward trend, maybe, uh, and a lot of variability, some huge spikes and decreases over time. Uh, so I thought, oh, maybe this will look better with the lowest fit. The other thing is this graph, uh, time is categorical. You can see uh, they all the seasons all run together. But in this lowest fit, you can see there's like kind of that gap between seasons. And so interpreting what the lowest fits between seasons is not useful at all, but it's interesting nonetheless. Um, so yeah, I have, I fit three lowest lines because I wasn't sure how wiggly I wanted the lines to be, but the blue one has the least amount of wiggliness than the red one, than the green. Um, and so it's interesting to see the different shapes they take and the general shapes that they share. Interesting to note from this lowest fit, is that if you look at the variability of the dots, especially in season two, you see there's a huge spread in average points per game per month in that first month. Uh, and then in the middle months, that spread gets a lot smaller. And then at the end, that spread gets a little bigger. So I was like, wow, I wonder if there's a lot of variability within season by team for how many points they're scoring a game. Uh, so then I started a modeling process um, I built four models and made them increasingly complex. So my first was just a regular uh, non-mixed element model, just a linear model. Um, then I started including some random intercepts, uh, one for the team that was the focus of that row and one for the opposing team to kind of say, you know, one team might be really good at scoring, but the team it's playing might also have a good defense. So I want to have a random intercept for both offense and defense capabilities of each team. Um, so that was like a, the second model. The third model, I added a random slope for game because I thought, um, because I thought if I was an NBA player and I was playing at the end of the season and it looked like we had a chance to make the playoffs, I would play really hard um, and try to score more points. But if it looks like we're not going to make the playoffs, I'm going to be really lazy because I'm inherently lazy and there's no point in trying this late in the season. So I wanted to see, you know, does how many points you score change 
by what your game number is within team, and that's what the slopes were for. And the same goes for defense, so there were two slopes. Um, and then the last thing I used was an error, error covariance matrix and error one process for the game for team nested within season. So I didn't want to look at uh, over all the games over all the seasons. I just wanted to look at the nesting of all the games within one season to see how much that changed. So those are my four models. And then each model took the elements of the prior model and added it on. So the models are shown cumul cumulatively. Uh, so here in the AIC table, we see that with no mixed modeling, you have a really big AIC. They're all really big, I guess. But um, adding intercepts drops that AIC a little bit. Adding slopes uh, for the laziness factor drops the AIC a little bit. And then adding that AR1 error covariance matrix also drops the AIC a bit. And this is kind of reflected in the covariance parameter estimates table. Um, we see that the rows with intercept labels uh, estimate a good chunk of the variability in scores. Um, the game rows, which are for those slopes, don't really estimate much at all. They're really small numbers. And then the AR1 estimates some, but not nearly as much as those intercepts. And then looking at the fixed effects parameters, we really can see, you know, does year make a difference as a fixed effect? Uh, and it looks like it really does. Um, going up five points in the 2016 and 2017 season is really interesting that people are scoring this much more just within that much time. Um, some other things that are nice to look at, it's good to know if you play at home, your probability of scoring uh, half a point is goes up. Um, rebounds help, assists help, steals help. Uh, blocks are really interesting because you wouldn't think that they would help scoring, but they were the only non-significant fixed effect in this model. And I thought, surely not everything can be important in a model, but I guess basketball is a simple enough game where most of the statistics make a difference in how many points you're scoring. Um, I also thought fouls were interesting. Uh, they both are increasing how many points you make per game. And that's partly because if you are fouling the other team, um, they're getting more shots, but in return, you probably get a rebound to score again. And likewise, if the other team fouls you, you're shooting free throws. So at the end of the game, regardless of who's fouling, you're probably getting more points. And that's why the end of games can last so long sometimes. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the project. It's interesting that year had that effect. Um, some limitations of this project is that data format that I was talking about earlier that I showed in the table one. Um, because each game has two rows, it's kind of weird to use both rows to model something, but you often do need to. Um, and so for example, like steals and turnovers, if you have a steal on one team, it's a turnover for another team. And so you wanna model both of these, but you don't want your modeling to be redundant. So I was trying to figure out how can I best do that? You know, Am I having a flawed analysis by modeling these things twice? And the same goes for fouls. Um, you know, if you're offensive fouling, it's giving someone else the opportunity to score, but it's also ham uh, hampering your ability to score. Um, the other thing I wanted to look at was like how the shooting helps. And I might look at three point attempts over time because I know the league has moved in the direction that a lot more people shoot threes. Um, but some of the scoring data is impossible to use in this model because if I use the variable, how many two point shots did you make? Um, obviously it's going to predict how many points you score at the end of the game because you always get two points for a two point shot. So there's this weird, like, I want to model this thing, but I can't because it's too obvious. Um, and that was interesting. Uh, and then also, if you wanted to do modeling for this, actually sports betting, there's so much you could look at. There's so much data. Um, I'm not that interested in the basketball, but I'm sure other people are. Um, so that would be interesting to model as well too. But yeah, that's that. All right, nice job, Matt. Questions for Matt? I do have one question. Just on the um, on those last models you fit, were you just looking at time as a, like a, each year, or did you break it down into any more specific? Um, let me find that model slide again. In the fixed effects, you mean? Yeah. Uh, so 
these rows here are looking at the impact of season and then this game thing is looking at the game number um and so game okay. is like treated continuously here so every game you're going to score 0.02 more points basically one thing i do want to do maybe for the final project is go back and look at that variance that's changing within season and maybe fit this instead of linearly uh, as quadratic or something Okay. And I think, I think that could be an interesting way to account for, now that I see you have game, that could be a way to account for like rest trends or something that I think have, have like been more common. I don't know if there's some way you could account for like, um, lately, like if a team plays on consecutive days, they might rest their best players for one of the two games or something like that. But, but right. I kind of like how you have it set up. Yeah, I mean, you could. There's so many things you could model with this, and I, I don't have the time for it. But yeah, yeah. Um, it might also be interesting to like, since you did these kind of like cumulative model fitting, to see the covariance parameter estimates from each model and just see how, just as maybe like a supplementary thing or something, and see how when you add these additional things, how those estimates change. Yeah, that's actually a good idea. I wonder if game isn't like taking up that much just because some other covariance parameter is. I'll look into that. Yeah, I think um, it might be more helpful to include variables such as whether in this season, the given team is actually in the playoff tier because this may have an impact on their scoring just because of their rank in the in their conference. Right. Yeah, I did think of using conference as one thing too, but you're saying uh, like, look at their previous uh, years. Like whether, yeah, like whether a given team made it to the playoff in a given season. Okay. Yeah, kind of related to that. Um, you were, you mentioned this, Matt, about you know over the course of the season, if you're not doing as well, you may get lazy, <laughs> you know, and that there's actually some truth to that. Not that you really get lazy, but but there's you know if teams see that they're going to be able to make the playoffs, they make they may make trades, um, they they make you know maneuvers so that they put them in even better position, you know, to get into the playoffs and get higher seeded. Whereas teams that aren't doing as well, they're, they're looking at the lottery, right? So they're right. not that they stop trying, but they're, they're not going to put that, they're not going to push quite as hard as the other teams. So I think there is a dynamic that happens as the season goes on, as you start approaching the playoffs. Um, that's sort of interesting. Um, I also, the, your random intercept, um, the multiple random intercepts is sort of intriguing where you have one for the team and one for the opponent. And I need to think about that more, but that's, that's sort of interesting how you did that. So, um, yeah, one other thing I was going to mention, let's see. Oh, you know, the trends over time, like from year to year, you know, you have an increase in, in points. Um, there, and you probably know this, there, there could be, reasons why that's happening. One, one, obviously, I think you touched on is there's just changes in how offenses are run. And, you know, with Golden State, you know, with the, the three-point shooting and, and, and that uh, sort of chemistry caught on and, and got popular and, you know, high passing recently and so forth. So the way offenses are run change. But it, I'm wondering, too, if it could be based on the rules that are set up, you know, sometimes they change the rules from year to year, which could have an impact on, you know, total points scored and so forth. So if you, if you happen to find any of that information, you know, you could maybe put it in the discussion, you know, possible reasons for changes in the average scoring per year. Yeah. Like the three pointer thing is something I'm particularly interested in. Um, just like, yeah, Golden State shoots so many threes and they do really well with it and it's catching on like the Rockets do it too. Um, 
So yeah, I the, it's crazy how much points have gone up just in this four season because you know it's like it hasn't been going up like that forever. Yeah, and I, I can tell you, like back in the '90s, um, it was it was definitely more defensive minded, and I, I'm thinking the average was was like under well under a hundred in those years. So if if you expand, you know, to even look at previous years, more previous years. Uh, You'll see even more, you know, changes over time in the points scoring. Um, it's as a as a very tall person, it's sad for me to see the decline of the stereotypical big man. But I guess I'm studying statistics and not playing in the NBA. So <laughs> uh, that's that's a good presentation. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Colin and Caitlin, um, who wants who would like to go next? I I can go now. Okay. Um, So for my project, I looked at um, the relationship between insurance type and then emergency department length of stay. Um, and the data that I used was actually from a work project that was kind of a bigger um, scope and I honed in on just this one outcome. Um, there's about 41,000 observations from the emergency department in 2018. Um, and the outcome that I picked was total emergency department length of stay, and the primary variable of interest um, was the insurance type um, with the hypothesis that um, individuals that did not have insurance and that were self-paying for their um, care would probably not stay in the emergency department as long um, to avoid having to pay for extra tests um, or blood work or um, what have it. So um, other variables that I included were um, gender, age, race, ethnicity, um, arrival mode, which would be if uh, patients came in um, in emergency medical services or if they did not. Um, and this was kind of a surrogate for um, like severity of a patient's symptoms coming in. Um, I also used primary care provider, whether they had patients had it or not, and then month of visit as the uh, PI had previously expressed that different months of the year were obviously busier. And so that might um, lend or an explanation as to why some people are just staying longer um, in general in certain months. Um, and then looking just at the general characteristics of the data, um, many people have repeated observations um, within patients. Um, that is kind of nuts, but some people are coming into the um, emergency room up to 22 times in one year. Um, we can see that the unique observations, there was about 30,000 of this 41,000. Um, so 10,000 observations were with repeated within a subject. Um, and then thinking about the structure of it, I thought maybe we could look at a hierarchical structure where you're looking at insurance type and there's patients within the insurance type, and then there's repeated observations within the patient. Um, so for, oh, I guess my table one first, um, just looking at this, there seems to be a pretty even distribution of length of stay um, once it's logged. However, we can see that uh, Medicare individuals and or people with Medicare and people in private insurance have longer ranges of length of stay than um, individuals that have that are paying for it for themselves um, fully. And then um, I thought it was, or, well, obviously with the age, there are um, insurance types that have higher age ranges and um, the VA and Medicare, which makes sense. Um, and then besides that, everything looked pretty similar across the board. Um, when in terms of data cleaning, looking at missing data, um, there were 1,800 missing insurance values. Um, and then looking across um, all of the observed observations, um, there weren't really apparent patterns. So I removed these values um, for the analysis. And then additionally, 
there was 130 missing length of stay values, but it was interesting because when I looked at those, um, the majority of those were based on gender. And when I kind of took a little deeper dive into that, all of them were women who were triaged to OB. And so I just thought that was an interesting point that maybe I'd bring up to an investigator in terms of there might be a miscommunication of recording length of stay. But um, this was less than a half of percent of the total population, so I removed those as well. So there was 39,000 observations in total for the analysis. Um, and then in general, I also log transform length of stay as there are people staying multiple days um, in the emergency department and then, but most people were staying hours or like an evening. Um, so the modeling approaches I used, I kind of did something similar to Matt where I was building off of um, a basic model. So the first I uh, used a random intercept at subjects level to induce correlation um, between observations within a subject. Um, the second I used a continuous AR1 covariance structure within subjects and that's this one that's similar to the spatial power where um, observations closer in time might be more similar but they don't have to be equally spaced. Um, so I use that with no random effects. Um, the third, I used the same covariance structure and then also induced a random intercept at the subject level. And then I did look at the three level hierarchical model with a random intercept on insurance level to induce correlation within subject or with, between subject within insurance and then at the subject level um, to induce the correlation between observations within a subject. Um, and then the results that I found, um, the estimates were actually all fairly similar to each other. Um, the p-value or the significance were maintained and the confidence intervals were nearly the same across all of them. Um, so then looking to the AIC and the BIC, the model that actually included the uh, random intercept at insurance and subject level had the lowest AIC and BIC, so I decided to use that one for my interpretations. Um, and so we see that insurance was significantly associated with length of stay time after adjustment for all of the variables that I mentioned previously. Um, in comparison to individuals who self-paid for their hospital stay, all others all other types of insurance except private insurance have a significantly longer length of stay. Specifically, the association ranges from 12% to 14.3% longer. Um, so in conclusion, uh, insurance does seem to influence emergency department length of stay. And as we were kind of, or as our hypothesis stated, those who have insurance are staying longer than those who do not. Um, and so the importance there is are uninsured individuals leaving before their care is completed due to extra costs in um, tests or whatever. Um, and so I thought for future work, it would be interesting to, because we, we didn't really have an actual variable that was discussing um, the symptoms of a patient coming in or the severity of their symptoms or their treatment in terms of what they needed to have done while they were in the emergency department. Um, since we were lacking that information, I thought it would be interesting to obtain, I don't know how easy it is to obtain this, but <laughs> obtain that type of information and include it in uh, future work. We do have that surrogate um, with the arrival mode, but it obviously doesn't explain all of it. Um, additionally, the data set that was given to me had uh, more years of data. I was just looking at this one at first because there are so many observations but it would be interesting to look at the other years to see if the results hold. And then um, if I do include uh, more of those years, I know that there is more missing data in those um, years as well. So maybe um, exploring imputation for the missing data might be useful. And that is all. Nice job. Caitlin, did you say, um, so you have some subjects come back, right? You have mm -hmm. uh, repeated measures on some subjects. I, I, I missed it if you said it. Do the underinsured tend to come back more? Or that uninsured? Is something I have, I think, well, when I was looking at the length of stay, um, I didn't notice that there were specific 
trends in that, but maybe I should specifically note that in the paper. Yeah, so like, uh, like thinking about a count for the number of times it come back, and, and I'm just wondering like if your conclusion is that the uninsured tend to have shorter follow-up, do they, do they leave before they're actually better, you know, so that they'll have, end up having to come back or, or something right. like this way? Right, no, that was a point that I was curious about. So thank you for reminding me of that because that's something I should look into. Um, for the reason they came in for your future work slide, um, I've done something similar with pregnant women who enter the ED and we found that it wasn't like their like primary diagnosis wasn't actually very influential on how long their length of stay was, but what was were things like what tests were ordered? Like, did they have lab work? Did they need an ultrasound? Did they need, like those things take different amount of time in the ED. Um, so if you had data on like what their course of treatment was while they were there, that could influence length of stay a lot. Right, I wish that I did because that was a question that when I was working on a different question with the investigators about boarding time actually. And they um, were talking about maybe trying to obtain that data later on about like what is actually going on in their stay um but i don't have that at the moment but that would be really interesting to look into i'm curious if you have oh. go ahead i'm curious if you have any data on like how much like the insurance covered versus like out-of-pocket costs that the um they had and maybe like if you can like combine them if it, it's not perfect but could maybe give you a sense of like, severity of why they're there yeah i also did not have access to that um they made it seem like when i was talking to them originally this is months back but they made it seem like it was kind of a struggle to obtain all this information in the first place um but Again, that would be something really interesting to look into. <laughs> I may have missed this, but do you have information about their reason for visit or you just don't have it at all? Mm -mm. It's oh. just, yeah, the one thing that we used in the study was um, just to adjust for the like ar arrival mode so, to see if it was kind of like severe or not. And that was okay. really, it, which is kind of a bummer. Um, I just, I want to know more about why they went to the emergency room 22 times in a single year. <laughs> <laughs> no. They, yeah, the only information they had, it was like, um, like an uh, inpatient bed requested. And then it was like, there was like very small information about where they were triaged to like triage to OB or like a couple other things, but that was like under a couple hundred that actually explained where they were going. Um, which is a bummer again, <laughs> but. I liked how you, you presented a, a table of estimates for the different models um, because that's something that, you know, typically we'll just look at the AIC and say, oh, that's the lowest, well, let's go with that. But it's kind of nice to see the impact that the model has on the estimates um, and it, it can impact the estimates themselves. I mean, we talked about the biggest impact it, it's likely to have is on the standard errors. And right. that's something you can tell, you know, by looking at the CIs that you had in the table. But, but actually, it can impact the estimates a little bit as well. Like you showed, they're not a gigantic difference, but, right. but there were some differences there. So, um, all right, nice job. Uh, Colin. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I did my project on analyzing uh, snow tell peak snow depth estimates over the last decade in Colorado. Uh, so just a summary of the data. Um, so on average, statewide snowpack in Colorado is peaking sometime in early April. So it builds up over the course of the winter and then that's where it starts melting faster than it's accumulating. Um, so from 39 stations across various mountain areas in Western Colorado, I have 
um, data on snow depth and SWE, which is snow water equivalent. Um, so like how much it would be if you melted it down into water. Um, and so this can uh, sort of account for the differences in snow density between sites. Um, and so I have data on both of those. Uh, I just took it from April 8th, which is like an average peak date uh, for each of the last decade. Um, and so I'm looking at a few things. I'm looking at uh, the effects of time versus the effects of station. So there are, you know, there are some stations that will regularly get higher amounts of snow. So I was interested in, uh, you know, which could cause greater changes in the data a year where everybody gets higher amounts of snow or just one site, um, which might receive that. I'm interested in the effects of elevation and location. Uh, location was entered into this data set as county. Um, I didn't want to use that just because um, they're just the way I, it's sort of spread and set up. I only have really like two or three measurement sites over a lot of different counties. Um, and so what I was able to do because I only have 39 stations is create an indicator variable for whether it was east or west of the continental divide. Um, and then the other thing I was sort of interested in um, was for snow depth, SWE is reported as a decimal, but snow depth is reported as an integer. So I wanted to compare uh, models treating it as a normal outcome versus treating it as a Poisson. Uh, so this is just a nice little visual of how some of these effects can occur. These two pictures were taken one year apart at the same location. Um, and you can see that the second year, there, just even in the background, there's much more snow on the higher peaks. And this, again, this is in July. The effect in April is only going to be, um, you know, larger, even if you won't be able to see it. Um, and so this is this is a, a pretty stark contrast. 2019 on average was the wettest year over the last decade in my data set and 2018 was the second driest. So this is maybe a more extreme example, but um, good to look at. So the first thing I did was uh, look at the snow water equivalent measures by year. Um, and just get an idea of the spread of that. And I did account for um, location in this plot. Uh, in general, we would expect the Western locations to receive a little more snow. That's just a, a pattern that naturally occurs in Colorado. Uh, and that was something you could kind of see in this data. The, the means for the blue box plots are a little bit higher than the, than the red ones, but uh, it's not a very large effect. It seems in this case smaller than the effect of year. We have a lot of variation from year to year. Um, and even just within a single year, we have a very large spread of SWE. So maybe the uh, effect of location is pretty small. Um, and the same thing here with looking at elevation. Uh, there does appear to be a slight trend where higher elevation will lead to increased snow, uh, which again is something that we might expect, but this trend is, is fairly weak and appears smaller than any of the site effects. Um, you can see, obviously each site is, the elevation's not changing from year to year, so if you have a stack of bars at one elevation, um, those measurements are all coming from the same site. Uh, so the first model I wanted to fit was one with continuous time, just to see if that was appropriate. Um, this is kind of limited by the fact that, you know, 10 years probably isn't long enough to look at anything that could be, you know, attributable to climate change or any general long-term trends in snowfall. Um, so I did, I did fit this model anyway. And I actually got a highly significant positive time trend for um, continuous time, just fitting a mixed model with a random intercept for station, just a very simple model. Um, so I was surprised by how significant this time trend was. 
But then what I actually did is I fit a second model, the exact same model, just removing the driest year and the wettest year and fitting the same model for the other eight. And the time trend flipped to negative and all of a sudden I had a significant trend going in the opposite direction. So I figured that maybe the continuous time model is a little bit too sensitive to this. And, you know, maybe it's just not appropriate to fit in this case. So the rest of my models were all fit with uh, time as a class variable. Um, so here, looking at the models for SWE, these were um, both just uh, treated as normal outcomes. I did a random intercept model uh, for station ID, and then also an unstructured model. And uh, significant years, so I used 2011 as a base year just because that's the way that R did it was it was slightly above average, but I close enough to where I figured it was somewhat appropriate. Um, so 2019 was the one year that differed between the two models, um, which was actually going in the opposite direction as the rest of the effects. Uh, elevation was significant for the unstructured model, but not for the random intercept model. Um, however, you can see that there's actually some uh, some pretty large differences just in the coefficients here. The uh, trend for divide location actually flips. Uh, and the intercepts, I believe, were much different as well. Uh, the unstructured model did have a lower AIC, um, so I don't know if this is maybe more appropriate. I didn't want to use an AR1 just because there's no reason to expect uh, correlation from one year to the next really uh, just because all of the sites are going to reset to zero over the summer. Um, and then on the right here, I just wanted to compare. So I have the, uh, the mean coefficient for a year and then uh, the mean absolute random intercept. So this is just, I didn't do any tests for this. I just thought it would be um, a good way to maybe look at uh, the size of the effects for year versus station. Uh, and in this, in this case, it seems like they're pretty similar. Uh, so then I fit models for snow depth as well. I started by fitting the same model as a normal outcome. Um, and in this case, I actually got a much larger mean absolute random intercept than year coefficients suggesting maybe the station effects are more important. Uh, and then I fit two different uh, Poisson models, a GE and an adaptive quadrature model, both also with the uh, same covariance structure with the random intercept for station. Um, and they, both of them uh, also suggested that these effects are now on the multiplicative scale. Both of them suggested uh, that the western stations would expect to receive more snow. Uh, however, the trends for elevation were inconsistent. Um, and in each of these models, all of the years were uh, determined to be significantly different from the baseline. Um, however, the one thing that worried me about this is the AIC is actually much, much higher for the Poisson models compared to the normal outcome models. Uh, so I'm just looking at this and saying, you know, maybe even though this is a integer outcome limited by zero, maybe the Poisson model is not actually very appropriate in this case. Uh, I wouldn't. I might try fitting another model for the final report just to maybe look um, more closely. I don't have any of the uh, other model parameters in here. I I know there was some over dispersion in the data, which would be expected. Uh, so that's something I might look a little more closely at. Uh, so conclusions are based on the models I did fit our prior beliefs regarding higher elevation and western locations raising snowfall were correct for most of the models. The trends uh, were present in that direction, but they were generally not statistically significant. Uh, there's a little bit of possible evidence for station effects being greater than year effects, but this is only in snow depth, not in SWE. Uh, so this is something that 
maybe you could look more into with a larger data set. Uh, Poisson generalized linear models may be a worse fit for the snow depth data. Um, so I may try fitting an unstructured model for that one as well and, and seeing how that comes out. Um, and then just some limitations. Uh, I would maybe like to expand the, the data set if possible, um, just to look at some more sites, but obviously you're limited by the few sites that um, Snowtel already has set up and a lot of them didn't start collecting data until like 2014 or so. Um, and so I wanted to look at, at just ones that had uh, data for the full decade. Um, and then the one other thing that I was considering is in the models that I did fit, I didn't have any time dependent covariates. And so I'm considering fitting a model actually comparing the snow depth and SWE, which could maybe account for, uh, like if there are any locations that consistently have snow of higher or lower density. Uh, and in that case, you would have w at least one, one, just choose one as the outcome and one as a covariate. And in that case, you'd have a covariate that's time dependent rather than elevation and location, which aren't changing. And that's all I have. Nice job. Questions for Colin? I have one question. Colin, have you, did you take a look at the locations of one of the locations that you discretized had wider space? Because I noticed in your box plots, one of the locations had larger variation than the other one. Um, yes. Yeah, so I didn't, I didn't look any tests on that. That doesn't, um, particularly surprised me. I think there are some cases where there are actually two sites with the exact same elevation readings. So maybe, um, you could, you could just have more data points and maybe one of them would be higher than the other consistently. Um, but I, yeah, I, that's not something that I've run any tests for, although that wouldn't surprise me. Um, just like I said, especially for the for the Poisson model, I know there was some over dispersion. Um, so I could see especially the the sites that get higher readings on average having a having a very high spread from year to year. Have you tried changing the way you discretize your locations into more than two groups? Uh, so I've considered that. I haven't I haven't done it yet, but I've I've been thinking about maybe trying to see if there's a way that I can sort it into, I know the counties would be too many groups and I would lose sample size, but if I could maybe sort it into like five groups, that's, that's something I would consider for the final report. Could you like split it up north, south at all? Or like by I-70? Uh, so I did not. I, that is something that, that's a way that I would consider doing it. Uh, for the final report, because I think I should be able to do that probably. Um, just because I guess it's it's nice where I can sort of I can manipulate the data a little bit just because there's not a ridiculously large number of sites. So I think that's a good thing for me to consider. Yeah, like you were saying, the south south southwest is like the wettest, right? And so by having, having both east and west and north and south or, or quadrants like that, um, that would be interesting to see. Um, can you pull up your slides again, Colin? Yes. Um, it, can you go back to, yeah, that one right there. This one? Uh, yeah, so um, I'm just wondering like I was thinking in my mind, a lot of moisture happens by, you know, the, the, the weather is moving generally like west to east, right? And like as air comes up to the mountains, it, it goes up and, you know, cold air condenses and then you get the moisture. I'm wondering if you would see more of a um, snow total versus elevation relationship on the 
on the western slope compared to the the eastern. And I mean, as I'm looking at the scatter plot, it does look like um, it, you see more of an increase if you look at the blue points compared to the the red points. Yeah, the, I, no, that that would be an interesting thing to test. I think, yeah, just based on the weather patterns um, and looking at here, there doesn't a, appear to be too much of a relationship uh, within the the red points. So yeah. I think that could be an interesting thing to test. I was I was curious because, like you mentioned. Um, the the southwestern portions getting some more snow and i think some of these these blue points around eleven thousand. um i think th i think that's what a few of those are mm -hmm. and so i would be curious to maybe just look at at a couple of those versus a couple of the other ones that i have uh like on the other side of the san luis valley that i think are a lot lower yeah i, I like your approach where you you're you did some sensitivity analyses to understand the trend and that that's good in general to look at if you if you you know if you you can see a slope relationship you know but how sensitive is it and especially when you have 10 years you know if you can explain that slope by just modifying two points that that's fairly important so that I'm, i think that was a good thing to do when you compared the aic and the QIC, I'm not sure you can really do that, but if, can you go to that table? Yeah, I figured the, this is just the way that it's set up. I, this yeah. is not something that's going to be, I suppose it's, it's not working with the true likelihood anyway. So yeah, so that's, that's not something that can be compared directly, but is that first row, is that a linear mix model or is that a, what, what kind of, uh, yes, first, okay. the first row is a linear mix model with a normal outcome. Okay. All right, nice job, everybody. Good talks today. Um, so we have five more talks, and uh, that's Monday. And then, um, then we have the review next Wednesday. And I've already put together a multiple choice quiz that I'm going to try uh, this game that my daughter showed me, um, Kahoot. It, it's a lot of fun. Um, and we'll see if it's fun doing longitudinal questions with it. I, I think it should be um, because you guys are going to compete and, and the winner will get something. Uh, so that, that'll that be a portion of that day. And then we can, you know, I'll probably have some other things to talk about. But if there's specific things you guys want to do in the review, um, let me know well in advance. And um, the other thing is, we have, um, we have to decide on the finals time. And right now, it, I'm not getting a strong sense. And some people have said Monday, some have said Wednesday. And so um, let me know this week whether you want, want to do it. And we're, we're just going to have to, well, here's the thing. Here's the thing is that we're not necessarily constrained to Monday or Wednesday because because we're on a Zoom link, right? So we don't have to worry about uh, classroom schedules or anything like that. So we could actually do another day. I, 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 I wanna get done by Wednesday because it, if it's later than that, it's gonna be hard for me to get grades in. So I really need to get done. I think Wednesday would be the last day. So, it, so really the choices are Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. Um, so if you have any preference, just send me an email to my, my work email and I'll figure out, figure out the time for that. Um, so otherwise, we'll see people on, on Monday. Now I was going to talk to, I think, Carrie, right? Is any, does anybody else want to chat about your project um, after class? Uh, yes, I do have a few questions. OK. So. Um, so I guess uh, I'll talk to Carrie first, um, and then uh, Weishuan, do you want to just hang tight and and um, then I can talk to you. Um, yeah, sure. And and if there's anybody else, uh, any anyone else uh, that would like to talk today. Okay. Otherwise, um, the the one last thing I would say is, don't forget 
you know, I know you're probably busy and it's easy to, to kind of things that are not like urgent that you, you kind of let go of, but I would uh, encourage you to look at the, the homework, the practice homework. There's a couple of homework things um, that you can look at. And so once you have some time, you know, um, do that and I can, uh, we can talk about those or, or I can provide solutions to those. So otherwise have a nice rest of your week and weekend and we'll see everybody on Monday.